Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are going to be studying the likeness of sinful flesh today. Applying some things to us, but mainly explaining that the number one thing that you need to remember and understand when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ is that, he, that God came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus Christ, who is God, gave up his incorruptible body for a corruptible one. Okay? And we're going to get into the definition of words. People hear the word corruptible and automatically think that he's a sinner. We're going to get into this and we're going to talk about this. Okay? So, um, I'm going to read a little bit. Sometimes I'll turn to it. Sometimes I won't. i got ten pages of notes. This is going to be a multi-part study. And sometimes I have things underlined in verses on my notes that help me emphasize and talk about certain things. So, and I'm a slow turner, so this will help make the videos go a little bit quicker. So, Revelation 1.8. I'm going to start by explaining. We're going to talk, read some verses talking about how Jesus is... Um, has been there from the very beginning, and he'll be there throughout all eternity. Okay? Revelation 1.8 I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, ending, saith the Lord, which is, it's present tense, which was, past, and which is to come, the Almighty, the future, on out into eternity. Okay? Uh, the Bible talks about in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Capital W word is Jesus Christ. Lowercase w word is the written word. Manifest word in the flesh and the wit written word, lowercase w. Jesus was there in the very beginning. Okay? What we're talking about when it comes to the likeness of sinful flesh, Revelation 1.18, I am he that liveth past okay? uh, and was dead, another past event. He was alive and he died. And behold, I am alive forevermore. That's present tense and out into the future. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Okay. Jesus has a body. And people like to use some of the things we're going to read. We're going to be explaining what the difference is when it comes to his Old Testament body was incorruptible to now God came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And people will take some of these verses and twist it and say there was no body in the Old Testament. There was no Jesus in the Old Testament. He's a created being. Or he only had a created body when he came, uh, when he was born of a Virgin Mary. Okay. 1 John 4, 1. And I've always got to touch this. Okay. When it comes to, we're going to talk about how basically people who believe the Trinity and a lot of these false religions, they push and lean towards and they tear Jesus down to where he's just like us, a created being. He's not God fully and completely God Almighty. Okay. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know we the Spirit, capital S, Spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Jesus Christ had a flesh throughout all eternity, from the very beginning on out to past the millennial kingdom and into the new heaven and new earth and out on into eternity. He had a flesh. He had a body. That's why is come is so important. We've done studies. I'm just going to brush over this really quick. Is come is so important because Adam and Eve in the garden could say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. It's present tense. Okay. You get into Abraham. Uh, the angel of the Lord is there. Moses, angel of the Lord is there. Okay, And you go through uh, when Jesus Christ came in the likeness of sinful flesh, which we're going to be talking about here. You could say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Right now I can say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. He's in heaven preparing a place for me. And all the other brothers and sisters in Christ that are out there. Uh, the time of Jacob's trouble. Someone who's in that time period that gets saved can say is come in the flesh. The thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, he'll be there ruling and reigning. You can say Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. That's why it's so important when we emphasize is come versus has come. Has come is always past tense. It's never present. It's never future. It's always past. All right. uh, and every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, 
Okay. Remember that we're going to get into this is going to be a multi-part study, and we're going to talk about how Satan is a spirit, Antichrist, so he tries to get Jesus, tear him down, get him to sin, and, and take his corruptible body and make it corrupted. He has a corruptible body, but he's perfect. He became sin who knew no sin. Okay? The form of a man we're going to be talking about. Okay? He, the Spirit, is tempting Jesus. Then we're going to talk about men, how they tried to tempt Jesus and tear him down, get him to sin, get him to cor corrupt. That's like He was in the likeness of sinful flesh to get him to become just like them, a sinner. Okay, and that there's a spirit there, an antichrist spirit. Where have you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world? Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. One of the things we'll be talking about is how Satan offered Jesus the world, and... Jesus is like, I ain't hearing it, okay? You're to serve God only and worship Him and serve Him only, okay? But there's people that they speak, therefore they speak of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God, he that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth. No, it's a lowest case S spirit. Our spirit wants to know the truth. And when you get saved, the capital S Spirit, the Holy Spirit, because there was a capital S Spirit up there earlier, comes in and guides us into all truth. One of the marks of a soul who's truly saved is you'll have a love of the truth. Okay? Hereby know we the Spirit of truth and the Spirit of error. Spirit of error is the Antichrist Spirit. Okay? Now, Mormons believe that Jesus Christ is a created being. They just flat out say Jesus is a created being and him, Jesus and Satan are both created by God and they're brothers, basically. Okay? They do not believe that Jesus Christ was there from the very beginning. They don't believe that. Okay? Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that Jesus Christ is the Archangel Gabriel. I'm hoping I'm not. Sometimes I get mixed up between Gabriel and Michael, but the Archangel Gabriel reincarnated. And then when he died, he just went, Archangel Gabriel just went back up. Okay. So, but here's the thing. An archangel, even if I'm getting it mixed up, an archangel is a created being, person, if you want to say. So they don't believe that Jesus was there from the very beginning. He's created. Okay. He's not God fully and completely. Uh, the Trinitarians... I'm sorry, but after doing this study, it's starting to sink in that the Trinitarians, they don't believe, they believe they're leaning to, towards more of their teaching is teaching that Jesus is a created being. Okay? Why? Because he's not God fully and completely. He's either up here, he's God the Father, there's only but one God, 1 Corinthians 8, 6, the Father. The Bible talks about it time and time again, one God, one God. Okay? Jesus is either up here, he's God the Father, one God, or he's down here with us, lowercase g God. You know, what, uh, uh, what did uh, Satan tempt Eve what, with? You can be his gods, knowing good and evil. What did Satan tempt a third of the angels with? You can be worshipped of God. You can be worshipped as gods and everything. They're trying to tear Jesus down. He, he's not fully and completely God, he's a created being. Now, they'll deny this, and they'll say, I'm kind of stretching it big time. We're not saying that. There's only one God, and they keep denying that Jesus is the Father, God the Father. They deny it, they deny it, they deny it. Well, if he's not God, then he's a created being. If he's not a created being, then he's God. Capital G, God, the Father. Okay? So, we're really going to dive in here, and we're going to start getting into it. But I wanted to point out that... The whole point of why we say this is because Jesus has a physical body flesh throughout all eternity. Past, present, future. Now, we're going to talk about a certain time period where he was in flesh, but what kind of flesh was that? Okay. Turn to Romans 8.1 in your King James Bible. Well, God's perfect written word uh, in English. 
Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Remember, first, they like to screw this up in a lot of the... Uh, uh, change God's word and a lot of the uh, Bible perversions. Uh, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, begotten, born of, derived from, God coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay, He says son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, condemn sin in the flesh. The two things to get from there. The whole study when I read this, I started with that verse, in the likeness of sinful flesh. The other thing to remember is to condemn sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, why did I say remember those two things? Likeness of sinful flesh. Okay, we are sinful flesh. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. We're going to talk about this, and sometimes I might be jumping ahead and just repeating myself. We have a corruptible body, and then we are actually corrupted bodies. We have corrupted bodies. But we're going to talk about what a corruptible body is. All right? And condemn sin in the flesh. If Jesus did not, God did not come in the likeness of sinful flesh, then he wouldn't have been able to die on the cross for our sins. He came, he had a plan, and he had such great love for us, that he gave up his incorruptible body for a corruptible one. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Mm -hmm. That the righteous law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Go ahead and turn to Philippians 2.5. Okay. So that's the whole start of this study. Uh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Philippians 2.5, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it robbery not to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Okay, the form of God. His incorruptible body, I believe. He was made in the likeness of men. He came, it says up there when we read, that God sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And being found in the fashion as a man, He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Once again, there we see it. There's a correlation between man, likeness of man, and the cross. Him coming in the likeness of sinful flesh and then uh, condemned sin in the flesh. There's a correlation there. If Jesus didn't come in the likeness of sinful flesh, sin could not be condemned in the flesh. Okay. Right here we read about um, being in the form of God. I believe it could be also be a reference to his incorruptible body. Jesus gave up his incorruptible body. God gave up his incorruptible body for a corruptible one. The likeness of sinful death. Okay. 1 Timothy 2.5 talks about, once again, when we read there, made in the likeness of men. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. There it says, the man, Christ Jesus. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was born in a corruptible body in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay. Like I said, for this study, as we keep going, the most important part is to understand that Jesus was born in the likeness of sinful flesh when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ. And the next study, after we get through all these parts, will be the second most important thing is that God, a king was born. The second most important thing when it comes to the birth of Jesus Christ is a king is born. We're talking about how he can be a savior because he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. All right. Then we're going to talk about him being a king. A king is born. So, 
uh, uh, we're getting into that in this study, but I want to mention it briefly here. In the Old Testament, believe it or not, Jesus was there, and they rejected Jesus Christ as their king in the Old Testament. He had an incorruptible body, and they rejected him. They chose man. They wanted a man to be king over God. So guess what? God came again as a man. Okay? Um, and I, like I said, I'll, we'll do a lot of verses and everything in this study when it comes. But I'll throw this up. But he came in the likeness of sinful flesh as a man to be their king, and they rejected him. They won't be rejecting Jesus Christ in the future when he comes again in his glorified body. And he will rule and reign for a thousand years. But when I was reading that about in the likeness of sinful flesh, um, the best example the Bible gave when I was reading about what it means when it says he's in the likeness of sinful flesh is Isaiah 7, 12. If you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to start in verse 12. Okay, Future prophecy about Jesus Christ coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. They has said, I will not ask, neither will I tempt the Lord. And he said, Hear ye, O house of David, it is a small thing for you to weary men, but will ye weary my God also? Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Butter and honey shall he eat, that he may know to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhorrest shall be forsaken of both her kings. Now, likeness of sinful death. Jesus had a, it's saying he had a choice, but a future prophecy is saying it's going to be God in the likeness of sinful flesh. He's always going to choose good over evil. He knows to refuse the evil and to choose the good. Now, just a little side note here on future prophecy when it says, Shall know to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land that thou abhor shall be forsaken of both her kings. Remember, out of the twelve tribes of Israel, eleven tribes had a king, and then there was a king of Judah, because they had separated two kings. Now, when Jesus came, what ha where were those two kings? Who was in charge? Were there those two kings there? No, they've been forsaken. Who was in charge? The Romans. Caesar. Okay. But right there, the likeness of sinful flesh, we see that example again in the Old Testament prophesying it. Okay, He's going to come, and he's going to choose the evil over the good. Okay. Now, what is sinful flesh. Well, it's, we could always just switch it around like you do with English and say, okay, sinful flesh is flesh that's sinned. In other words, you have a corruptible body and you have a corruptible body and a body that's been corrupted. Sinful flesh is a corrupted body. Okay. Psalms 51.5 Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. In sin did my mother conceive me. Psalms 58.3 says, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Now, two stories. A brother in Christ told a story that I think is still the best example story ever. You have a little child that's got chocolate all over their face, all over their hands, and they get caught getting into chocolate. And they get asked point blank, did you get into that chocolate? And I'm talking about like a little kid. And it's, let's say it's a daughter. And she looks up at her parents and goes, no. And she's got the chocolate all over her face and her hands. I didn't get into the chocolate. What's going on there? Okay. Go astray as soon as they are born speaking lies. I remember as a kid, we almost burnt the house down. And the place just reeked of smoke. My mom was taking a nap. And... We tried to hide things, but my mom came through the house. She could smell the smoke. She finally found all the burnt stuff that we had hid and everything. And because there was a pilot light that the old heaters, the baseboard heaters, the pilot light, we were using that to burn paper and stuff. And we just looked at her and denied it. We, we didn't do anything. We weren't doing anything. And all the evidence was there. Okay. And we were little kids. Okay. 
Bottom line, we are born corrupted in a corrupted body. Right? Some people say corruptible. No, we're born in a corrupted body. Right? We are not held accountable. We're innocent until the age of accountability. I agree with that 100% that a child will go to heaven. If a child dies before the age of accountability or the catching away of the body of Christ happens before the age of accountability, that they're innocent. But you got to understand, we're born in a body that's been corrupted. Okay? So when did this first happen? Okay? Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Okay? He had a, I keep saying he had a corruptible body. We'll get to this. Versus being corrupted itself, but a corruptible body. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead. We'll say the definition again anyway. A corruptible body is a body that is capable of being corrupted. Doesn't mean it is. Just means it's capable Okay, and as we're going to read this study, we're going to find out Adam was always created in a corruptible body. The angels are created in a corruptible body. The only person, one person, Godhead, that had an incorruptible body was Jesus Christ in the Old Testament and throughout all the future. Now, I'm talking about in the past, there was only one. In the future, we'll talk about that too. Well, there will be other people other than Jesus Christ that have incorruptible bodies. But he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. So when did the flesh become corrupted? Right. Romans 5.12. You want to turn to Romans 5.12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Who's that one man where it says, by one man sin entered into the world? We'll turn to Genesis 2.16. Go back to the Old Testament to Genesis 2.16. We're going to talk about the command. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayst freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. That's the command. That is the first dispensation, and it was works. Not faith works. Jesus Christ in his incorruptible body was walking around the garden. Okay, they could, Adam could see him. He was given a command not to do something. He was created, I believe, when we were doing the study, with a corruptible body. Remember, corruptible body doesn't mean it was corrupted. Adam was sinless when he was first created all up to one point. What was that one point? Well, if you turn, flip over to chapter 3... Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. Okay. He had a corruptible body he was created in, but he didn't, have, he didn't know any sin. Now, oftentimes you have the Bible referring to the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam was in a corruptible body, and he failed. He chose evil over good, and he ate. He, he went against God's command. Okay, That's when the flesh became corrupted, sinful flesh. Okay. 1 Timothy 2.14, here's the part that's important. What we read about Jesus Christ, the prediction of Jesus Christ from the past, coming, saying he's coming in the future. And we read about it in the future, they're coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. 1 Timothy 2.14, and Adam was not deceived. Okay. A lot of people can't seem to get that. They say Adam was right there belong, right beside Eve when Satan was deceiving Eve. They both would have been deceived then. Adam wasn't there. Adam was not deceived by the serpent. Eve was. But there's an important, there's, this is so important why it's, this was the way it was, if I can get the words out. But the woman being deceived was in the transgression. In other words, Adam chose to sin. He wasn't deceived. He chose evil over good. That's why he's referred to as the first Adam, and then you have the second Adam. Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh, and the, he gave up his incorruptible body for a corruptible one, and proving that he is God, he never chose evil. 
at all. He became sin who knew no sin. He was sinless. His, he was never corrupted. And we're going to go through and, uh, and talk about some of this stuff. Right? Now, Adam chose to eat from the, the tree. He chose evil over good. Now, Jesus being born in the likeness of sinful flesh, as we're going to read some incidents in the last part, parts of the study about mankind. Satan tries to get him to sin. Mankind tries to get him to sin. And he always chose good over evil. He was perfect. He was sinless because he's God manifest in the flesh. God coming in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, now, God chose, the uh, question that I forgot to ask you is, how many times have we chosen evil over good? As we read there, the account that Jesus is being prophesied, he will always choose good over evil. We read about Adam, how he started out by choosing good, doing right. But eventually, he chose evil. And the reason I say he was created in a corruptible body is, remember, corruptible, the definition is it's capable of being corrupted. That's what corruptible means. doesn't mean you are corrupted. It just means you're capable of being corrupted. Okay? People will sometimes say Adam was created in an incorruptible body. Then he was not capable of sinning. He wasn't ca he, there's no way he would have eaten from that tree because he's not capable of it. Being created in a corruptible body, okay, that's the change that happened. Okay? And when they sinned and that body was corrupted, death came into the world. And I might be jumping ahead of myself. Okay? That's when sin entered the world. But how many times have we chosen evil over good? How many times have you fallen into temptation, brothers and sisters of Christ, and sinned, even as a saved sinner hence the word save sinner, have fallen into temptation and disappointed God. We've chosen good in our lives. We've chosen good. King James Bible is, my, is God's perfect written word. It's my most prized physical possession. We've chosen good in our lives. We've done things that make God proud. But then we've done things where we've chosen evil. We've fallen into sin and temptation and disappointed God. Right. Adam did this. Right. We do this. But you know what? Jesus never did. Jesus always chose good. He, he, uh, I want to say it right. <laughs> right here it says, no, He knows to refuse the evil and choose the good. He refuses evil and chooses good. He is sinless. He is perfect. Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And the thing is, is when he chose good over evil every time, it was proof that he was God the Father. All, every time. I'm, when we read these accounts of Jesus, Satan, I'm not listening to you. Sorry, I'm not doing things your way. I'm not doing things the world's way. I'm not giving in and corrupting my flesh and becoming a sinner. He's proven that he's God, manifest in the flesh. Right? 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We talked about this. When he dies on the cross, he be, it says right here, hath made him to be sin for us that knew no sin. Okay? The likeness of sinful flesh. He was born in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had a corruptible body, but he was never corrupted. Right here, he knew no sin. He took on our sin. That flesh on the cross took on our sin, the sins of the world. But he himself knew no sin. Okay? Once again, I'd like to point out, the cross wasn't possible if, Jesus, if God did not come in the likeness of sinful flesh, if Jesus wasn't born in the likeness of sinful flesh. There's a lot of love so much love that you can't even I, you can't even measure it or fathom it sometimes how much love that God had for us for you and me for those who accept Jesus Christ and don't reject him who come to the cross broken completely broken 
Sorry. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Okay. Right there, we have corruptible bodies, but we are also, we'll read some verses where it says, all of sin have come short of the glory of God. I'll just throw that one out there. Uh, we are already corrupted. Okay? And someday we will be uh, put on incorruption. Okay? But we're talking about the two words there. Corruption, corruptible and incorruption. Corruptible means you're capable of being corrupted. Incorruption means you're not capable of being corrupted. You're not capable of sin whatsoever. Okay. The Webster's 1828 Dictionary, just to go ahead and read it out specifically, corruptible, that may be corrupted, they may be vitated in qualities or principles, okay, that they may be corrupted. Adam had a corruptible body. Also, I'm probably skipping ahead a little bit, the angels were born with a corruptible body. I mean, let that one sink in and think about it for a little bit, okay? Uh, a third of the angels, Satan was able to deceive a third of the angels. Uh, you can be worshipped as gods, follow me. Uh, if they had an incorruptible body, that means they're not capable of being corrupted. See, we use words that we've heard and we pass it on and pass it on and pass it on. The angels do not have an incorruptible body. Okay. Two-thirds of them are sinless, but they don't have uh, an incorruptible body. We see a third of them fell, so they're capable of being corrupted. But once again, it's pointing towards Jesus Christ as being God. He's the only one that has an incorruptible body in the Old Testament and an incorruptible body in the New Testament. And I didn't put this down here when we talked about the angels, because I didn't do much on the angels, because this isn't a big study on the angels themselves. But you read about before the flood. The angels were coming down here, and they were failing big time. All right. Once they came and left their first habitation, they came down here and they couldn't handle it. Jesus is the only one that, that was perfect regardless. Even when he had likeness of a corruptible body, when he had his incorruptible body, perfect. When he had his corruptible body, perfect. When he has his glorified body, perfect. Sinless. Only one. All right. Now, is there any argument that we are in corrupted bodies? Not corruptible. I know it says this corruptible must put on incorruption. What it's talking about is the change. Adam was perfect before the fall. He became corrupted. It's just talking about the change of we have corrupted bodies, bodies that are corruptible, and now we're going to have bodies that are incorruptible, not capable of being corrupted. Okay? But is there any argument that we have corrupted bodies today? Jesus didn't. But we do. Philippians 3.21 Who shall change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body according to the workings whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. See that first verse we read about how we're going from a corruptible body to an incorruptible. Right here explains what's going on even in a more detail. Okay, Our vile bodies, our bodies that are corrupted. Okay, or be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Uh, is there any argument that we have corrupted body? I don't think any brother and sister in Christ out there, Bible-believing, God-fearing, man or woman out there, is going to say, this body is not corrupted, this body isn't vile. I am not a sinner. I'm sinless. Okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 52, if you want to turn there real quick. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall rise incorruptible. Okay. I'm reading some of this again, but I wanted to read it in more context. Incorruptible. The dead will rise incorruptible. And we shall be changed. For this corruption, which we read earlier, must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruption shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, Notice how the two go hand in hand, okay? Corruptible, mortal. Incorruptible, immortality. Okay? Those go together. 
Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. The reason I say that like that is because with Adam, they still had to eat from the tree of life. They had a corruptible body. They had to eat from the tree of life. They ate food from all the other trees. Right? They weren't immortal. So they didn't, they have, I don't believe they had incorruptible bodies. There's a distinction between the two. Right? But as we see, we have corruptible bodies and we are corrupted. Jesus had an incorruptible body, but he was never corrupted. That's what it means for the likeness of sinful flesh. People will take that and a lot of these Satanists will make it out where Jesus is a liar. A lot of these Bible perversions make out Jesus to be a liar. I mean, seriously, uh, they'll change the word of God and turn it into a lie. And they try to tear Jesus down to make him a sinner. Okay? Likeness of sinful flesh means he gave up his incorruptible body for a corruptible one. Only he never was corrupted. Now, one thing we talked about, but I want to read some verses on it where it talks about if Jesus was not in a corruptible body, how could he take on the punishment for the sins of the world? Okay. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. We read about this one. Okay, To be sin for us. An incorruptible body is not capable of doing that. Sinless, not capable of sin. Sin cannot even be in his presence. Okay. Um, that we might be made the righteous of God in Him. Right. Romans 6.23 Why do we say that? He became sin who knew no sin. Romans 6.23, a lot of us know this one. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is what? Death. What happened to Jesus on the cross? He died. He took on the sins of the world. He became sin who knew no sin. Right? The likeness of sinful flesh. Hopefully some of this is sinking in. I found a lot of this stuff like it makes more sense. I already believed a lot of this stuff in a general sense. But doing this study, a lot of it's really sinking in and making it's really being revealed more. Okay? When sin entered the world, death entered the world. Okay? We read about that, how it's synonymous. Um, incorruption, see, corruption, mortal. Incorruption, uh, immortal. Immort immortality. Okay. Most important thing to get from Jesus is the understanding of likeness of sinful flesh. What it means. It doesn't mean he's a created being. It doesn't mean that he's a sinner. Okay. We have sinful flesh. We have sinned. Our body that's corruptible has been corrupted. Jesus has not. God came into the earth in the likeness of sinful flesh with a plan all set up. And we'll read more about this. Jesus proved he is God by never sinning in a corruptible body. It was only way to save us from our sins. Okay? He had a plan and he set it in action. Uh, Matthew 26, 39 talks about it. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Okay? It was the only way to save us. And Jesus chose, because of his love, God's love for us, to do, to die on the cross, to take on the sins of the world. Okay? He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Now, could God have destroyed man? And started over many times. I mean, was it the only way for God to do his thing? Like, oh, I don't care about mankind. Just, you know, wipe them out and start all over. Or I can just, you know, destroy the earth and start off with a new earth. Let's read on times where he could have done that. But because of love, he didn't. Okay. Uh, Genesis 6-5. Go back to the Old Testament. Genesis 6-5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he hath made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, 
I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made, man, made them. And you read um, about Noah. Noah's not perfect. He's still a sinner. But if you read some of the things in here where it says, every imagination of their heart, of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That wasn't Noah. He was righteous in the sense that he turned to God. He made a mistake, he probably turned to God. He wasn't perfect. But as you see here is an incident where God did destroy the world, but he didn't destroy all of it. So saying that God had to do what Jesus had to do, he had no choice. He had a choice. Just like coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, his whole walk, his earthly ministry, his life before his death on the cross he chose good over evil mm -hmm. he chose to die on the cross was there other things that God could have done yeah he could have just wiped mankind out and start all over um, but he didn't and, um, now I notice here because someone's gonna bring it up he did the bow and the cloud and it promised he'd never flood the earth again there's other ways to destroy the earth other than flooding the earth mm -hmm. um, Exodus 32 9 here's another situation where God was going to destroy a certain set of people and start all over mm -hmm. Exodus 32 9 and the Lord said unto Moses I have seen this people and behold it is a stiff neck people now therefore let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. Okay. They had sinned so great when they came out of Egypt, Moses was up in the mountain for 40 days talking with the Lord, and getting the Ten Commandments that are on the tablets, and the Jewish people decided to worship false gods. Aaron made them a false god, a calf, and they started worshiping him. And God's like... You know, I've had enough. I'm just going to wipe them out and start all over with you. And it's a whole other study where Moses is like, No, God, what will people think? Please, Lord, don't do this. What will people think and everything? But the bottom line is not that he wouldn't do it. It's he could have done it. He could have started all over with uh, Moses. Moses could have had 12 kids. 12 more tri tribes could come from Moses. He could have started all over, but he didn't. I'm just trying to point these things out that... That wasn't the only way God could have done things. It was just the only way God could have saved us, reconciled us to him. It was the only way. That was love, what God, what Jesus went through, coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, giving up his immortality, uh, his uh, incorruptible body, and immortality to come down and be an immortal body that needs sleep, that needs rest, that needs food, it can be hurt, hence the pain he went through on the cross. Mm -hmm. But he overcame death. Uh, Matthew 3, 9. Even uh, John the Baptist, before Jesus uh, revealed himself, mm -hmm. he was born by this time. And think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. Once again, people like to limit God. Don't take for granted what Jesus did for you on the cross. Don't take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Every day, you know, especially when you fall into sin and temptation, you come to go back to God broken as a sinner and you're repenting. I just don't want to take that cross and I do my best not to take that cross for granted, what Jesus did for me for granted. Okay. There's a verse in here where we'll talk about it, and I don't want to jump ahead, where it talks about how people do take the cross for, van for, for granted, when it talks about, am I supposed to sin that grace may abound? People do take the cross for granted, false converts. Okay. Uh, we're not to sin that grace may abound. Don't take the cross for granted. Now, I use these verses to prove that God could have destroyed mankind and started all over. God could have done different things if he wanted to but he had love for us and that's why things happen the way he did that's why it's so important that he came in the likeness of sinful flesh right? John 15 13 this is what I'm trying to get at when I said that God loved us so much 
that that was the only way, and that's what God did. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He died on the cross, paid for the sins of the world, took on that sin, became sin who knew no sin because he had a corruptible body, a likeness of sinful flesh, yet he was sinless. He was perfect. And John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. I always talk about this. People say, I'm the friend of Jesus. Are you doing whatsoever he commands you? Remember Jesus in the garden, if there be any way, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. I suppose he set an example for us what this is talking about right here. We're supposed to obey God's commands. Okay, that's how you're a friend of Jesus. No greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. What's the opposite of a friend? Enemy. What did Jesus do? He reconciled us to God. Reconciled means you were an enemy, but now you're no longer enemies. You're friends. Okay. Now, God did not lay down his life for Christ rejecting sinners. I always have to throw that in there, okay? Because people will say, well, Jesus paid for the sins, present tense, of the whole world. He paid for your sins that reject Jesus Christ. He paid for your sins, you know, and your... No, he paid for the sins of those who come to the cross broken. He took on the debt of sin. He became sin who knew no sin. Uh, now he's the one that has that, that note, as you say, the title, and you owe him. You come to him broken, he'll forgive you. Okay? He'll wipe that debt clean. If you don't, you'll be answering for it and paying for it at the great white throne. And the punishment is eternal torment in hell. If I can get the words out. Okay? Okay? Jesus chose to die on the cross. You can choose to come to God broken. It's not about... People are born to be saved and people are born to be lost. You don't have a choice. You have a choice. Jesus had a choice. He chose to obey. He chose to stick with the plan and die on the cross. Come in the likeness of sinful flesh and die on the cross. All right. Luke 16, 22. Right. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being torment, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. The reason I read that one is just to mention that there's Abraham's bosom. Okay, It's a place where the Old Testament saints went because they couldn't go to heaven. Their sins were covered, but they weren't washed away. Jesus still had to come in the likeness of sinful flesh and die, the, the was it the um they try to say the gospel's been the same i'm not saying the gospel in the old testament was the death burial and resurrection i'm saying it still took jesus's blood to wash their sins away he still had to come in the likeness of sinful flesh and became sin who knew no sin the perfect sacrifice in order to wash their sins away okay but there was a place they had to go to before they could go to heaven they needed that perfect sacrifice and it can only happen if Jesus came in the likeness of sinful flesh. Matthew twelve forty. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the well's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I read that because when we get into Ephesians 4, 8, people like to say, use that as saying Jesus went to hell. Jesus never went to hell. He went to Abraham's bosom. Because if you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, we read this. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity, captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heaven, that he might fill all things. He, took, he led captivity captive. He went down there to get the, people, the saints in Abraham's bosom. But remember, the importance of this study is that the likeness of sinful flesh. There's a corruptible body and there's an incorruptible body. In the future, we will have incorruptible bodies. Okay? Right now, we don't. 
and check in my study notes to make sure I didn't skip anything before we go on to part two. Now we read already on how we, and I didn't mention it then, but how we put on incorruption. This corruption must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. At the catching away of the body of Christ, we will be given new bodies, incorruptible bodies. We'll be made in like His glory, His glorious body, in the image of His glorious body. Okay. We will have incorruptible bodies. That's why I know I have a brother in Christ saying we'll be angels when it says we'll be as the angels, which we'll be talking about in part two. But I think we're still going to be a little bit different than the angels because we're going to have incorruptible bodies. Bodies that are not capable of being corrupted. Remember, the angels are capable of being corrupted. A third of the angels are corrupted and they come down. They're kicked out of heaven. There's a big war that goes on. Okay? That's not possible if you have an incorruptible body. A body that's not capable of being corrupted. So part one, sinful flesh. What is sinful flesh? It's flesh that is sin. It's flesh that has been corrupted. He came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And I uh, talked to a brother in Christ in the comments, there's one thing God can't do, and that is sin. I, I, I haven't changed, I'm not changing. What I'm saying is, is that he's he had a body, not that he, Jesus, not that God was capable. The body he was in was capable of sin. But he never sinned. He never was corrupted. Corruptible, capable of being corrupted. That's what corruptible means doesn't mean you were corrupted, it's just that you're capable of it. He had a body that was capable. And as we're going to get into the second part, we're going to show how um, he was tempted by Satan uh, hardcore. He was tempted by mankind hardcore on trying to get him to sin, to try to corrupt, get him to corrupt that flesh that was corruptible. And he didn't. He was perfect. He was sinless. So... Uh, I will see you guys. We're going to move on to part two of this study. Satan tries tempting Jesus. Uh, mankind tries tempting Jesus. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. My love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I will see you in part two of this study.